treatment refractory depression, treatment resistant depression. It's really our failure when the patient doesn't get better. It's not their failure, let's be honest. And instead of having a pre-success, I like to call failure pre-success, where we view it as something they have to do, and there are some things they have to do. It's good, in my opinion, if we turn that pre-success experience, where they're not better yet, into curiosity. Take the energy, direct it into curiosity. Curiosity to learn more and find more ways to figure this out. So, in terms of, uh, just the beginning. Definition of treatment, refractory depression. So I may have mentioned yesterday that after psychiatric training, psychiatry training, I did a two-year fellowship in mood disorder. And you may have come away with the mistaken impression that I did that in order to enhance my knowledge, understanding, and training, and that I'm very ambitious and curious. I was forced to do that fellowship in mood disorders. I didn't want to. I went kicking and screaming. I'm glad I did it. I mean, in retrospect, heck, it looks, I mean, it's really good. But at the time, it was not my idea what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a generalist. And I turned out to be a mood disorder specialist. So treatment refractory depression basically is one of the two topics when you do a mood disorder fellowship. Um, the two topics are bipolar and treatment refractory depression. Essentially, in mood disorders, those are the topics. Um, and the definition of, of uh, treatment refractory depression has changed over time and varies depending on who you ask, but fundamentally, at least two months, or a long enough time period, of at least two different medications from two different categories at a sufficient dose, um, dose duration, two different categories. That's essentially it. Um, and what do you do about it? You can take more time on the antidepressant. You can increase the dose. You can add a different antidepressant. The first time I saw that, it was a patient, a patient who came in on, on 300 milligrams of imipramine and <coughs> Nardil. And I called the person who put this together. I said, you mix tricyclics and monoamine oxidase inhibitors? And he growled, it works. <laughs> Apparently, the drug-drug interactions are rare. They don't always happen. As you know, if you prescribe MAOIs, people break the diet and they're fine, most of the time. But when it's not fine, it, it's not fine. Um, add another type of antidepressants. That, that really means type means a different category. And when I say category, I mean mechanism of action. So if it's an SSRI, you can try an SNRI. You can try bupropion. You can try something with a different mechanism of action, switch antidepressant, augmentation. So this is really the core of the treatment of, was the core of treatment, refractory depression, augmenting with other medications. Antipsychotics, first generation, second generation, mood stabilizers, very popular anti-anxiety medications, thyroid hormone. How many people use thyroid hormone as augmentation? Oh, okay, so we've got a few louder, uh, louder with the hands. Raise them up higher so I can see where you are. Okay, now. How many of you use Cytomel T3? How many of you use Synthroid T4? Oh, wow, it's all T3 now, except one or two people. It goes back and forth depending on the year, and there's certain institutions that say T3 and T4. Um, so it's T3, everybody but one T3, wow. Used to be different, it changes. Okay, that's the third possibility. How many people use a mixture, armor thyroid or nature thyroid? Okay, it's interesting. I, to be honest, I've gone back and forth with a great curiosity over which one works better. And every couple of years I say, oh, damn the Synthroid, I'm going to try Cytomel. And then three years later I'll hear my say, damn the Cytomel, I'm going to try Synthroid. But I never can tell if one works better than the other. Thyroid hormone is very funny. You never know when it's going to work either. Some people it works in a couple of days, some people it works in a couple of weeks. Um, but it's helpful. And you don't have to check levels, although it's a good idea to check levels because once you start it, the levels don't mean anything anymore. Lithium, lithium, or other drugs getting genetic testing. So genetic testing is extremely useful in about 2% of patients. 
It's a $5,000 test, three to $5,000. It's coming on very strong. How many people have been approached by these genetics companies? Genomine, GeneSight, blah, blah, blah. Okay, how many people are using it? There's nothing wrong with using it. You, you just have to be aware of the, the limitations. Um, it, in my opinion, the greatest usefulness of the genetic testing, they, most of the companies, they cost about three to $5,000, but they, they tell the patient, your liability is capped at $300. So the, the insurance company gets billed for $3,000. They fight back and forth, the genetics company and the insurance company, and then the patient pays $300. Why is that a good thing? Well, besides for the clinical data that you get of questionable utility, usually, it wipes out the deductible. So in January, if a patient has a $5,000 deductible or a $10,000 deductible, Genetic testing is just such a good idea. <laughs> the clinical information you get from genetic testing and the financial benefit the patient reaps from genetic testing it makes it worthwhile in January, February. Anyway, sorry, need to go on and on. We'll talk in more detail about that. Genetics temperament. So temperament is a very interesting idea. It, it's actually a very old idea. It has, has to do with the idea of mixture of different ingredients. So a person's temperament is sort of their inborn tendencies for certain things. Personality includes temperament plus character. So temperament's the inborn part of personality and character's the learned part of personality. Symptoms, uh, we go through that, and physical testing too. So alternative treatments for depression include light therapy especially for seasonal affective disorder and uh, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. There's data to support those. But regular depression light therapy is very helpful too. Light therapy used to be this box that people sat in front of. How many people have recommended light therapy ever? Oh, we got some enlightened, aware people. Good. Um, now there is a, uh, a device you put on your head and it's right over your eyes so it doesn't interfere with your vision. It's called Luminet and I do not receive any income, residuals, or benefits from the Luminet company. They're located in Belgium. It's kind of fun to email back and forth with them in French and tell them how wonderful a product they have. Luminet, I'll, sh I'll show it to you if, if you're interested. It's only like $130, you can get it on Amazon, and it is remarkably effective light therapy. Sleep hygiene, sleep deprivation. How many people even know of sleep deprivation therapy? You've heard of it. How many people have, have used it in a hospital on patients? Yeah, very few people. It's very rarely used. Um, the way I was taught to do it, you keep the patient up all night the first night, you let them sleep three hours the second night, and six hours after that. Lowering sleep is an amazing way to get people out of depression, but it's almost never used. In order to be safer on the sleep deprivation therapy as an outpatient, I simply cut back in sleep one hour per week until they're not depressed anymore. You have to be careful as an outpatient because you can induce mania with almost every treatment for depression can induce mania. Sleep hygiene, the two things I encourage is waking up at the same time every day for regularity, which improves cognitive efficiency. And the amount of sleep should be between six and a half and seven and a half hours per day. Many people say eight hours and that's wrong. Younger people may need eight hours, but if you look at the Kripke article, you see there's a sweet spot between six and a half and seven and a half hours. More increases morbidity and mortality, less increases morbidity, mor morbidity and mortality. Vagal nerve stimulation, I guess it should say vagus nerve stimulation. There's two flavors now. One is the little hockey puck pacemaker inserted surgically and the other one is the transcutaneous vagus nerve stimulation also usable across the neck. It's FDA cleared now for opiate withdrawal and headache. ECT is an option for treatment refractory depression, especially in the elderly and people with psychotic depression. RTMS and CES, cranioelectric stimulation. The only treatment for depression that I'm aware of that has a zero rate of mania induction. Lithium can be used to augment. Stimulants can be used to augment. How many people augment with stimulants? Yes, it's really good. And I think it's especially good in bipolar patients because it helps entrain the sleep-wake cycle. Um, even small amounts. We were taught to only use it in very old people, tiny doses of Ritalin or dextroamphetamine. 
um, and use it in terminal cancer patients because they don't have four weeks for things to work. Stimulants. One pet peeve I just want to share with you because I'm the only person you will hear this from as far as I know. How many people here know the contents of Adderall? Does anybody know what is in Adderall? Tell me. Tell me mixed amphetamine salts. Is that what you're going to tell me? What, what, what does that mean? Everybody here is taking chemistry. What does mixed amphetamine salts mean? Amphetamine and dextroamphetamine. and dextroamphetamine, right? Now, you all know that there's an antimers, left and right-handed molecules, and the right-handed molecule is dextroamphetamine. And the left-handed molecule, did you say amphetamine? Levo. Who said that? You said levoamphetamine? How many people here have heard of levoamphetamine? Couple. Who knows what product it's in? Vicks VapoRub. <laughs> levoamphetamine is Vicks VapoRub. Levoamphetamine has a half-life two hours longer than regular uh, dextroamphetamine. It has less attentional properties, and it causes approximately 80 to 90 percent of Adderall side effects. 25 percent of Adderall is levoamphetamine. 75 percent is dextroamphetamine. I converted um, more than 100 patients from Adderall to dextroamphetamine, and I watched insomnia go away, irritability go away, anxiety go away. It was extraordinary. One or two people liked the Adderall better. There, there is population variation, no question about it. But the vast majority of patients feel much better on dextroamphetamine. In fact, the people around them, too. I got a thank you note from a family who said, we love Josh back again because he used to be so irritable and difficult to get along with. Thank you for fixing his medications. All I did was change the Adderall to dextro. And you can do the exact same dose. You don't have to do any conversion. Basically, the person gets a little bit more dextroamphetamine, which is the active ingredient in Adderall. So how Adderall ever got to where it was and how that company snowed everybody in the United States and got them to not think about what was in it. It's a little bit like hand waving. Mixed amphetamine salts. Does that mean? <coughs> that means 75% dextroamphetamine, 25% levoamphetamine. And pharmacists don't know this either. I didn't know it. The, the reason I finally came across it was it was the 18th year I taught psychopharmacology, and I was coming up to the stimulant lecture, and I remember this twinge of guilt and shame that I had every time I talked about Adderall. I would say the half-life of Adderall, and then inside, a little voice in me was screaming, you know that couldn't possibly be true, because it's not one compound. It's more than one ingredient. It couldn't possibly have one half-life. And I said that to myself for 17 years, and on the 18th year, I said, I'm going to look into it. I'm going to find it. And I dug and dug and dug and dug. And I actually had one of the companies send a request for information, and I finally got to the bottom of this levodextro thing. There are people who think that levo is a good thing. There's a new product that's 50-50 levo and dextro called Evicchio, which for 97% of the population is worse than Adderall. So if you want something to really make people feel uncomfortable, it costs an enormous amount, use Evicchio. In any case, stimulants, sorry to go off on a rant. Add another antidepressant, thyroid atypical. How many people here think Abilify and Rexulti added to an antidepressant is amazing? People haven't had that experience where you add Abilify or Rexulti and boom, the patient gets better? Because I, I've been very impressed with it. Um, you know, the, a, a, as a mood disorder specialist, you know, we were steeped in all these different techniques and combining them, lithium and thyroid and stimulant and light and sleep deprivation. And then Abilify came out and it was just like, wow, this like supersedes everything from the past. And I really felt like there's really no need to do a fellowship in mood disorders anymore. Don't even consider it. Because you just add Abilify or Exalti, it's kind of boring. But then comes the ethical issue. Somebody comes to you with treatment-resistant depression who's been on two medications at a sufficient dose for a sufficient length of time of two different categories, but never Abilify or Exalti. What do you do? 
if you give them Abilify or Exulti and they get better, you don't get to do TMS on them, right? <laughs> what the heck were the... With and everything's going to be good. Oh, the doses you can use are tiny. But you can use one, mili know. one milligram of Abilify twice a week. Uh, pardon my geek dumb, but I, I look everything up. The, the half hour of Abilify is 74 to 92 hours. So after three to five days, technically after five weeks, but after three to five days, you just do it twice a week or three times a week, one milligram, and there are no side effects. And, and it's a catalytic reaction, you know, because it has to do with, it has to do with the serotonin 7 receptor. The company says it's the the dopamine 3 receptor, it is not, and I can show you the, the references that show the exact mechanism of action, how it works with the serotonin 7 receptor. Um, but tiny doses are necessary. And, and if you look at the PK values, you know, the binding coefficients, you can find out that, um, that as you go down in the dose, the, the binding gets less and less and less. But at about 1 or 2 milligrams a day, it's like 38%, about 0.38. So it's, it's, it's very... The receptor occupancy is, is, is very good, even at very low doses. Um, and there's no side effects, in my experience, at one or two milligrams twice a week. Anyways, what's perpetuating the person's depression? We're, we're uh, evaluating treatment-resistant depression. Response to treatment, including Medicare. Are they taking the medications as directed? Ask in detail. Um, are they taking herbal supplements that are interfering? Or is the medication uh, interfering, uh, interacting with... Uh, grapefruit juice or something. Discuss whether you're taking medications as prescribed, physical health conditions. You want to review medical conditions too. It makes things more complex, but it's very useful sometimes because sometimes their medical condition is causing depression or the treatment of the medical condition is causing depression. Comorbidity is the big one. Comorbidity. What else is going on? There is a very small population of patients who have major depressive disorder symptoms and no other symptoms. Major depressive disorder symptoms, no anxiety symptoms. Major depressive disorder symptoms, no bipolar symptoms. Major depressive disorder symptoms, no personality issues. There is a group of people like this, and they're the people who participate in paid drug studies. They don't really have that clinical status. They know how to Google things. And they know that if they have any other symptoms but depression, they won't be entered into the study. So they maintain all of their symptoms are major depressive disorder, and they have no symptoms of any other condition. And then when they're done with that study, they do the same thing with generalized anxiety disorder. They have only those symptoms and nothing else. This does not exist in the real world. This patient who has symptoms of one condition of nothing else, the idea of this is an idea that gave psychiatry a little bit more dignity and prestige. The idea that conditions have criteria and people fit into these categories and people have condition A and they don't have condition B. And the, DSM, the first DSM with criteria was 1980, DSM-3. And by DSM-4, by 1984, way before DSM-3R, by 1984 it was clear that Psychiatric patients don't actually group into categories according to symptoms. But the more obvious thing is that comorbidity is the rule, not the exception, and everybody knows that. So if you have a patient with major depressive disorder, and especially if you have a patient with treatment refractory major depression disorder, there is comorbidity. Tell you a secret. Comorbidity equals severity. And the deep truth that people who've looked at the data, I can show you the data, Regier and Kupfer and anybody who's looked at the data, the truth is, as you increase in severity, you increase in comorbidity. It doesn't mean that people who have a mild condition don't still have some comorbidity and a mixture of different things, but you basically can't be severe without comorbidity. So comorbidity, in my opinion, is... Um, one of the most important things we have to look at. APA guidelines, blah, 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 first attempt treatment. So if you miss, if you fail one antidepressant, you can consider TMS. That almost never happens. Um, or you can switch to a different class, augment, add atypical. These are the guidelines for the treatment of depression. Going the wrong way again. 
Okay, so this is one of the most interesting things about our field. People who've been selling TMS machines for a long time have become a little bit cynical about whether or not TMS will ever catch on. How many people think here TMS is going to be huge? How many people thought that and then waited a very long time and noticed that it didn't happen? Okay, so the longer you've been in this, the longer you've noticed that it's obvious this is going to take over, but it's not happening. Well, one of my mentors, Donald Franklin Klein, uh, told me the story of how psychopharmacology went through this. Psychopharmacology was coming in against this enormous headwind of psychoanalysis, which actually downplayed psychopharmacology. They used to call it a pill, psychodynamic psychiatrist. They used to say, if you give pills, the person won't have symptoms that they can talk about and work through. And then the Oshroff case happened. The medications were there. Klein had shown that they were effective, done beautiful trials, done very, very well done statistics, wrote a textbook on psychopharmacology, the treatment of psychiatric disorders, a light blue book that old people like me know about. I know I look young and attractive, but I'm actually very, very old. I may heal over any minute. Oshiroff happened. A uh, uh, kidney doctor in, I think it was Maryland, was hospitalized uh, and treated with psychodynamic psychotherapy. The diagnosis was narcissistic personality rule out bipolar disorder. And I think it was eight months he received psychodynamic psychotherapy. How are you feeling about your mother right now? Do you have any dreams you can tell me about? And then a friend from New York flew down, checked him out of that place, took him to a doctor who prescribed lithium, and within five days he was in complete remission and was in remission from then on, on a relatively low dose of lithium. And he sued that um, institution, it was called Shaw versus Chestnut Lodge and um, sued them because during the eight months that he was hospitalized slash psychodynamically incarcerated, he lost his wife, his family, his business, everything. And he won. And that moment in 1979 changed everything. Before that moment, it was acceptable for a psychodynamic psychiatrist to say, I'm not giving medication so that the patient can experience more angst and make progress in therapy. After it, that was really not acceptable anymore. And everybody just shift their, shifted their practice. Am I totally losing the metaphor here that this could happen with TMS? Okay. So at any point, somebody is going to come along and say, wait a minute, I spent 10 years being tried on different medications and nobody told me about TMS. That's not okay. Doctors have an ethical duty and a legal duty to inform their patients of FDA approved methods of treatment that are known to be effective. This is one. My blood was boiling at the US Congress of Psychiatric Services when I heard Dr. Dr. Jane Rakesh and Dr. Christopher Meisen talk about different depression treatments. They talked about new depression treatments. And they talked about ketamine. I thought, ah, oh, they'll talk about TMS. Then they talked about fecal transplants. <laughs> I'm like, why are you talking about fecal transplants and not TMS? But I didn't say that out loud. I just maintained a very calm Midwestern appearance and looked bored. But inside I was thinking, this is complete insanity. And these people are in charge of this conference. <laughs> TMS was not mentioned in the discussion of treatment of uh, depression. And fecal transplantation was. And they spent about 15 minutes talking about Peter Kramer and listening to Prozac. This was 2018. I was, I was just, it was like an alternate reality. You know what I mean? 
for people that don't know anything about TMS, which is almost every psychiatrist, it's an alternate reality. And they, they dismiss it by saying, oh, I'm waiting for more evidence to accumulate and substantiate the medical literature that there is some beneficial effect of TMS. People will say that out loud with their mouth, unaware that there's 18 times more data supporting the use of TMS than there was supporting Prozac. It's just unbelievable. But pills make sense according to the paradigm, and machines that make noise, uh, most psychiatrists don't understand. Most psychiatrists couldn't even make the, the leap to a patch antidepressant. That freaked them out. So hopefully things will change suddenly and maybe there'll be a lawsuit, maybe there will be a movie, maybe there will be a TV show about this, but it will break through. Maybe somebody will have a 15 year old who was suicidal and suddenly got better with TMS and decides to contact a friend and make a TED talk about this. If only they could find an enthusiastic and charismatic and interesting person to give a talk. Unfortunately, those kind don't exist anymore. That was back in the days when the ships were made of wood and the men were made of steel, and now it's the opposite. <laughs> Psychiatrist is under no obligation to recommend TMS, but they are under an obligation to inform. And when you think for just a moment about what the odds are, what are the odds of getting better? The STAR-D trial has shown that if a person has not gotten better on three antidepressants and you try a fourth, what are the odds? Anybody know? 6.9%. 6.9% chance that person's going to achieve full remission. What are the odds that a person who's failed three antidepressants who does TMS is going to get better? 40 to 60%. The first data said 18%. Yeah, the meta-analysis for remission. Uh, remission, for okay. Remission 18.5%. Yes. How many people here have more than 18% remission in their clinics? Yeah. The, there was a group of, of three private practice clinicians in San Antonio that pooled their data and showed that 18%, 40%, 60% remission. In private practice, it's different than in academic centers, partially because patients are real patients. They're human beings that are suffering that want help. At university centers, when patients come in for studies, they Google the syndrome first, they report those symptoms. It's much harder to separate from placebo. In a fundamental way, the psychiatric literature, based on patients who really aren't patients, is deeply flawed. And that's why many times in the community you see much higher rates of success. But I agree. Maybe it's not, maybe it's not 40%, maybe it's 20%. But data varies. In any case, the bottom line is the difference between 7% remission with pills a fourth time and TMS 18 to 40% or 60%, that's a huge difference. And from an ethical and from a legal and from a humane standpoint, doctors should be telling their patients about TMS. And everybody inside is nodding, yeah, right, how are you going to do that? It's going to happen. Okay, treatment-resistant depression, in my opinion, is not one thing. It's like, it's like in some sense, it's doctor refractory diagnosis. We say depression, but we know that depression is a heterogeneous group of people. The, Outcome cannot be predicted on the basis of the diagnosis major depression. There is no validity in terms of predictive validity to the term major depressive disorder. Okay, And I could show you statistics on why, why the factor analysis and the clustering just does not lead to anything useful. So you have to look deeper than the idea of major depressive disorder. And the old way of doing it was asking about symptoms and coming up with diagnosis. If there's one thing we know in 2018, symptom clustering and diagnostic categories from that do not have a biological basis nor predictive validity. In fact, National Institute of Mental Health no longer uses the DSM because of this. So it's better to use different perspectives, and if, if this looks like axes, I wouldn't blame you. But to look deeper into a person, you have to look at the genetics, the personality, the symptoms, the current condition in a careful way, and then physical measurement. 
predisposition. So temperament is the predisposition for mood swings, for irritability, for mood tendencies. You can measure temperament in terms of the tendencies for low dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine by Cloninger's TCI. So we're going to go through this relatively quickly. Um, and then physically, you can look at um, things like EEG, heart rate variability, galvanic skin response. So an intelligent response to diagnosing psychiatric patients means that it's not a clustering of symptoms leading to name calling of one word. Oh, you're bipolar. It has to be something that exists in time because psychiatric processes occur in time time, not in cross-sections. Just like fish swim in water, psychiatric conditions exist in time. So we have to think in terms of a narrative for each patient, a narrative of their predisposition, their personality, their symptoms, their mental state, and their physical state. So measurement, um, state measurement, you all do state measurement. I don't have to talk about this. Temperament measurement is what we do. We also do genetic testing. We also do... Well, what do you have to say about methylfolate? It's very interesting. Because <laughs> you, you have only for poor metabolizers. How do you know if somebody's a poor metabolizer? Yeah, testing. So the, 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 the genetic variation is the right. C677T. There's another one called the A1298T, which is irrelevant for us, has no effect on psychiatric things. But the 677T, if a person has that mutation, they have a 30 to 40% reduction in the conversion of folate to methylfolate. If they have homozygous for that mutation, it's like a 60% reduction. And that has impact because you can have increased homocysteine and homocysteine can constrict blood vessels. Homocysteine can uh, prevent the production of Dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, actually methylfolate's necessary for the synthesis of those things. And, and also, um, epigenetics all rests on the presence of methyl groups and acetyl groups to tag the DNA. So, um, so it's a very important issue. There is a genetic test. For 125 bucks, LabCorp will do this for you, and you'll find out if they're heterozygous, homozygous, wild type, or otherwise. The thing is that it doesn't predict whether they'll respond to methylfolate. And um, so methylfolate is? Oh, I agree, I agree. So what I do, and I know this is eccentric, but I give every patient that comes in the door um, methylfolate, a small amount tapering up to a larger amount, and then see if they respond or they don't respond. I don't really care about the gene. The, the, the number of heterozygotes that respond and don't respond, you just can't predict by the genetics. Um, so. It's interesting, but uh, I do an empirical trial the first week they come in, and then they return after seven days, hearts filled with deep gratitude for the healing impact of their interaction with me.